regenerative farming really suits what our members already do. Because what we found is actually an awful lot of them are re practicing, you know, doing regenerative practices already talking to members who've been on the regenerative path a bit longer than others, they've demonstrated that they can either maintain or increase productivity, but also lower costs, and therefore become more resilient for the future. There's nothing better than getting out and actually seeing something in, in the flesh, so to speak, but also members learning from each other. We felt it important to hold workshops that, that gets our members together in order to be able to both ascertain what they're all doing already, but to encourage others to maybe adopt some principles that they're not already doing. So the principles of regenerative farming are, it's about a holistic approach. It's about understanding that it's not a set of rules. There aren't things that are banned. There aren't things that, that have to be compulsory. So we talk about regenerative farming and soil health being part of that whole soil food web, part of the infrastructure of the above ground biology and the below ground biology. So the five principles that we'd ask members to consider before they, they choose anything within their action plan is first of all livestock integration. So livestock integration on most dairy farms is, is an easy thing to achieve, but obviously it can be some fields that only, are only cut for silage. So livestock integration on every field is, is a useful thing to do. Also minimizing soil disturbance. So we're not banning plowing, but we would encourage members to consider other, other ways of establishing a new crop. There's a lot of direct drills. There's a lot of slot seeding opportunities with modern machinery more than there was uh, a few years ago. We also are encouraging members to think about protecting the soil surface. So sometimes that could occur in the summer where soil can bake if it hasn't got a cover of a growing crop, but also in the winter. So some crops like maize traditionally have resulted in land being left bare over winter, becomes a runoff risk. Obviously bare soil without a living root is not feeding the soil biology for a good part of the year. So things like cover cropping or even in inter-row establishment of the maize simultaneously in the growing season. So when it's harvested, there's already a crop holding the soil. We also would like members to consider to encourage plant diversity, because plant diversity means there are different depth rooting species. Those species will actually benefit the different biology in the soil, and it also varies the diet for the cow. So these, these soil health principles, these regenerative principles, are a set of ideas, a set of uh, a view on how to choose what might be improving the soil on every farm. Hopefully that will end up with more carbon being sequestered, but most importantly will also end up with a, a, a field or a farm that's more productive with less inputs. If we think about regenerative approaches, the fundamental starting point for anything to do with regenerative farming is soil health. Soil is the starting point from which everything else will flow. And a key focus for a lot of the practices that are being discussed today are to help to build that soil health. So if we think about that diversity of planting material and those root depths, that's helping to improve that soil depth and that microbial activity. The real focus with this transition to a regenerative approach is the ability of these practices to regenerate our soil and the soil being the center point for everything else that will flow through it. And that providing the healthy soil, providing the healthy plants, which provide the healthy cows, which provide the healthy people. So compaction is our number one structural issue that we'll find on dairy farms. And it's not just for dairy farms, it's on the majority of farms, especially where we're dealing with livestock, we're dealing with challenging weather conditions and needing to be able to have our stock out and grazing and tractor movements and all those sort of things. In terms of how we remediate compaction, again, that first step is to understand where that compaction is and the severity of it. Our plant roots will be able to help in terms of busting through some of that compaction, but it may well be that we have to utilize some of those mechanical options. But again, going back to understanding where that compaction is and identifying the correct depth and then applying or using that machine where the conditions are right in terms of soil conditions, moisture and climatic conditions to be able to remediate that problem. Dealing with those 
structural issues is the first point before we start to move to some of these transitions to these new practices, because it will really give you the best opportunity for the, to get the benefits from those things if we can get everything started in a really good structural condition. So we can use cultivation equipment. It's about understanding why we're using it, whether it's addressing the issue that we've identified, and then thinking about some of those more medium or long-term strategies to put those plants in that will stop us having to use them in the future. So there are a variety of tests that farmers can do to see whether they've got good or bad soil. The starting point is always going out with your spade and having a look. Because what that allows you to do is start to look at how your soil is structured. If we then move into some of the more analytical tests that you have to send off for the lab, you can do that to test your organic matter, your organic carbon and to look at your chemical balances and those are really useful indicators in terms of piecing together the different jigsaw pieces to see how you can start to build soil health. If we're looking at from a structural perspective as I say breaking your soil apart physically looking at it is a really good starting point but if we then want to understand the capacity of that soil to be able to sequester carbon and link into those sort of wider societal benefits then analysis is really your best bet and when we're looking at analysis it's then about being consistent so making sure you're being consistency in your approach in terms of taking the samples and then where you're sending them for analysis. So we've been really, really fortunate um, at all of the farms we've been to that we've had a mini digger in. So we've really been able to expose a lot deeper than a no we would, when we would normally dig a pit. And what this allows us to do is really start to be able to appreciate the importance of depth. We can see here that this field has got a high amount of organic matter that we're seeing up at, this, up, up at the top depth here and starting to then transition down into these deeper soil levels, which have a real crucial part to play in terms of the ability to start to increase that rooting depth, bring that microbial activity down and start to get some carbon stored at depth. But it also allows us to understand how the roots are moving down, whether we're able to actually see those roots penetrating through our soil and actually accessing all of these deeper layers. So we can see here that we've got our plant roots actually penetrating down through our soil profile. We can see that we've got roots further down here, which is showing that the soil is nicely structured. What we can also start to see is that we can see that these, actually, these bits of soil are glued onto our soil roots. So we can start to look like these sort of hairy roots here. And that's showing us that we have a good biological population in our soil. And we can see that those roots aren't having to go sideways because they're hitting areas of compaction. They're able to percolate all the way down through our soil profile. And the idea of some of these more diverse species like we've got in this field with a diversity of rooting depths is that we can start to pull that carbon and that microbial activity further down our soil and be able to really utilize the whole full depth of our soil profile. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at how our soil breaks apart. So how easily it is. We can start to see here that we've got a few areas of rust, which may indicate that over the winter, we've had a little bit of waterlogging. Now that waterlogging might be as a result of structural issues, but it might also be as a result of actually the amount of water that we had. But it's a really good indicator that you can look at in terms of looking at how your soil is structured. What we're also seeing here is a nice spread out of our plant roots throughout our soil. We've got some good earthworm burrows here and we can start to see that we've not just got an adult earthworm here, but we've also got some juvenile earthworms, showing that there's that really good biological community because these earthworms are providing a really good function in terms of helping to sieve our soil, helping to make those nutrients more available and also providing that architecture and that structure that allows our plant roots to be able to go down deeper and do what they need to do. So if we're thinking about improving soil health, the consideration to start to implement one of these more min-till or no-till approaches is a really good starting point because what those approaches do is they reduce the amount of carbon that's being lost through that soil disturbance. If we compare that to our conventional ploughing approach, that turning over of our soil, that sudden flush of oxygen will release a load of carbon. And what we're trying to do, especially within these regenerative practices, is keep the carbon that we've already got within our soils and then look for the opportunities to pull more of that carbon in. So over the more medium term, thinking and starting to consider how we move away from those 
cut plow, plowing systems over to some of these more lower disturbance systems is a really key management practice. But it's very much about making sure that we're creating the best environment to be able to utilize these practices. So making sure our soils are well structured because then we can start to use some of these new and innovative approaches. So my three top messages for farmers. Number one, soil health is the starting point for a resilient and regenerative farming system. So understand your soil health. Become more intimately acquainted with your soil. Number two, grab yourself a spade and go and dig. Because what that allows you to do is start to understand how your soil is structured, what your risk factors are, and allow you to start to piece together how you're gonna create a system which is in better structural health, which is building organic matter, which is growing more grass, and which is better quality for your cows. And my third thing to think about is really just to think about how soil health allows you to really start to create this resilience, looking at your soil as a sponge. Your soil is that catalyst that allows you to start to hold more water and to cycle more nutrients. So create the conditions that your plant roots, which are doing the magic, can really thrive and do what they need to do to create that resilience. My name is Emma Adams and I work for the Farm Carbon Toolkit as a Farm Soils and Carbon Advisor. And as part of the first Milk Roadshow, we've been talking about soil biology and how that helps with overall soil health. So soil biology is critical for grassland farmers. They're a really underutilised or often underthought about resource that we have for free within our fields already. So soil biology can help reduce the selective grazing pressures that we have in our paddock systems whereby the breakdown of organic matter and dead residues from grassland or plant species can be incorporated back into the soil profile to aid the plant nutrition. So by encouraging soil biology we can encourage the speed at which we can get around the farm with our grazing and also help with our nutrient cycling. A main part of soil biology is the soil food web and how that relates to the other properties that we think about with our physical and chemical properties. The soil food web helps with the biology because it shows the whole interactions from our grass and organic matter all the way through to our worms and our insects. Three main issues we've been thinking about on the tour is our worms, our fungi and our dung beetles. Worms are always important in soil biology. They're a great bioindicator and they can help to demonstrate how your soil health is being generated and managed on the farm. Worms are throughout the soil profile and by digging a soil pit you can often inspect how they're getting on. Ensuring you've got enough field soil moisture and the right conditions can always help find worms and a good number would be to find 10. Another thing we've been thinking about is our fungi and how fungi and bacteria are often seen as negative things within our lifetime. However, within the soil, they provide a great matrix and a great basis for the rest of the soil life. In particular, the soil fungi that we like to think of in grasslands is the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And these are brilliant because they provide an interaction between the soil and the plant root in which we can help utilize nutrients that are usually unavailable to our plants. Dung beetles are the last thing we like to think about with soil health. They're often overlooked on farm and can be identified by the holes they leave in the cow pats. Their role is really important because they help to break down the organic matter in manures into the soil which stabilises it and helps with the plant nutrition cycle. This is a really important element that displays the importance of soil health and how it can be an economic benefit on farm. We can utilise what's in the soil beneath our feet to help with nutrient cycles and help reduce the bagged inputs that we often rely on. So improving soil health and maintaining it are key management aspects that we'd like to promote and also to consider when we're in our management planning. So if you're out digging a soil pit to look at soil structure, why don't you count your worms whilst you're out there? When you're moving the cattle in the morning or taking them out, if you see any cow pats, are there any holes in it? Have you got any dung beetles? It's just to always be considering how your day-to-day -day management is impacting on your soil biology. And consequently, having a look, having a count, and remembering that if you don't monitor it and measure it, you don't know how your impact on your grassland is going to be going forward. 
The main takeaway messages in regards to soil biology from these workshops would be to make sure that we're not taking the grass too short when we're grazing. So to leave a little bit of bite left or when we're silaging or making hay, just leaving a little bit of residue behind rather than taking all of the organic matter available. In this way, we maintain the root growth below the ground and keep the cycling of the photosynthesis and the sugars down into the soil, which helps feed our soil biology and keep the process running. So in essence, what I was trying to demonstrate to people is that, you know, agriculture in general, we're trying to turn the use of the sun and the, the solar rays into use that energy in order to be able to produce crops. And whether those crops are fed directly to humans or in this instance, you know, creating grass. Plant diversity can enable them effectively is that we can maximise and get more because we increase our solar panels. If you've got different leaf types, whether it's shape, length, or actually different crop heights, you're actually, what you're doing is you're maximizing your solar panels. You're also enabling that as well, is by different root depths, which is those roots are then which is like also exude sugars, which feed the soil microorganisms, which release the nutrients, again, at different depths. So some of these plants can operate down to sort of like 600, you know, 800 millimetres down to a metre. And therefore you're able to use a greater amount of soil and therefore it's, the overall productivity goes up. The plants themselves satisfy the nutrition in different ways. They'll have different mineral levels. They'll also have different energy and protein levels. And therefore that's a very good way of actually like, you know, satisfying the needs of, of actually grazing animals. In terms of diversity, what, what, what we're looking to do, which is like, you know, is to have, if you can imagine the concept of actually like we're saying here about, of actually maximizing our solar panels, which is like, you know, you, you've, got, you've got here, actually a mixture of grasses, and which is like, you know, so certain in here, we've got some Timothy, we've got some ryegrass, we've got plantain, we've got white clover, so the different size leaf in terms of the white clover as opposed to say the red clover, and therefore, and we've also got chicory. So there's a good diverse mix here. And if we kind of, if we, if we could, if we could quickly dig down in there and turn that over, what we would find is actually as like you'd have different root depths and different types of roots. So you would have effectively some which would be more prostate and actually finer roots, such as like which are operating um, nearer the top, maybe in the sort of top 20, 30 centimeters. Whereas some of the other plants would actually have tap roots and be going down, and actually, like you know, up to half a meter. Even this has only been established sort of uh, a couple of years. And what, of course, that does, you're, you're, you're maximizing the amount of growth in terms of, so you're capturing the sun, but also, we actually, it's like, you know, the uptake of nutrients, but also moisture, you've got a greater chance when you're actually operating at, at, at far deeper levels. And from a, from a carbon sequestration point of view, which is like, and again, the same, the same would, would, would be, be the case, is actually as like those roots will be going down, feeding the microorganisms at far deeper levels, and then they would in turn, which is like, you know, be increasing soil carbon, which is like, you know, and at those levels where you're below the plow line, once the carbon's in there, which is like, you know, we, we basically, it sets you there for, for good. I don't think a different type of grasses shouldn't be overlooked either. And therefore the um, new varieties of Coxfoot and actually is like, but also incorporating Timothy and fescues can also give that diversity again, in the same way as it can with broadleaves, such as like, you know, you can get different root structures actually in different root depths. And therefore it's equally important, which is like is to incorporate different species of grass as well. They're not without problems. You are restricted. You can't necessarily as actually use any broadleaf weed killers. So you don't want to be putting them into a weedy situation. In the same way as actually, it's like, you know, they do require different uh, management. So they're more suited to rotational grazing than they would be set stocking. In terms of establishing them, there's, there's many ways, particularly with technology now, direct drilling is very effective. But the root management does need to be slightly different. 
But again, in talking to the practitioners who've been doing it a few years, it's well worth the results because you can, you can get the same level of productivity, but with lower inputs. The best way to do this is to actually is go away and see how you can establish these principles in your own system and give it a go. The experts on each individual farm is the farmer themselves. And therefore what we're looking to do, and particularly in plant diversity, is if you're not incorporating, if you're just using perennial ryegrass at the moment, is consider putting legumes in. If you're already doing that, actually is consider putting in, say, maybe plantain or chicory. It's talking to your agronomist, the seed merchant, and saying, what do you think would work in my instance? So at our regenerative farming workshops we've talked a lot about uh, the benefits of increasing soil organic matter. One of the most important benefits of soil organic matter, especially in a changing climate, is the greater the soil organic matter, the more likely we are to be able to hold water. So a 1% increase in soil organic matter is equivalent to 25,000 gallons per acre of extra water holding capacity. What that means is that land that possibly is drought stressed can hold water for longer. So when we have rains in May, but very warm weather in July, then, then that organic matter will act as a sponge and hold the water that, that deeper rooting plants can access. So soil infiltration rates can vary across different fields, different farms. Obviously soil type is relevant, but the most relevant thing is actually the amount of soil biology or the amount of compaction or a comb combination of the two. So if you've got a really slow soil infiltration rate that creates a risk of runoff, so whether it be fertilizer or manure, if the following day there's rain after you've just had an application of either of those with a slow infiltration rate, the likelihood is the water will run off and take nutrients with it. The best infiltration rate we've seen going around the country at these workshops is around 35 seconds. And the slowest actually was about 20 minutes and we got very bored and walked away. So the difference in risk of those, those two fields was, were very significant, but the likelihood is it indicates a very different level of soil biology. Because not only the earthworms and the beetles and the biology we could see, but the biology we cannot see creates micropores in the soil. It also helps with soil aggregation, so it holds the soil into loose lumps so that water can infiltrate better. What we've seen time and time again is that permanent pasture tends to come out the highest, i.e. the best infiltration, and the lowest infiltration tends to be land that's had a lot of machinery, or possibly has actually had a lot of cultivation. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do a soil infiltration test, which we'd encourage members to do. The equipment needed is really simple, but that soil infiltration test is actually a really good health check for, for soil. So do it around the farm, do it in different fields, uh, very cheap to do and as long as you keep your results then hopefully as soils improve over the next year or two then these results will also get better. So we're just going to do a very simple water infiltration test. For this you need a 6 inch metal ring, something to hold 450 millilitres of water and a stopwatch or whatever you've got perhaps on the mobile phone. So the 450 millilitres of water into the 6 inch metal ring is approximately equivalent to an inch of rain. So if we pour it in as quickly as possible, press the start button, and what we're looking for initially is, is some bubbles to prove that the, there's some aeration in the soil. Also, you can start to see it move quickly. We've removed most of the vegetation so we can actually see when the water is level with the, with the soil. And Hopefully we'll see a result that's uh, somewhere near five minutes, which is in, in indicative of a, of a soil that's, that's probably got enough biological activity, the soil that's able to, uh, to be infiltrated by water reasonably quickly. We're really keen to encourage members to do the soil infiltration test on their own farm. The equipment required is very simple. You can do it at any time. It's a very quick and easy way of understanding some elements of soil health. 
It's also a great way of preventing runoff risk and assessing the risk before spreading of either fertilizer and manure. So we would encourage members to do it, to keep the record of when they've done it and uh, also which field they've done it in. And then over time, if those results improve, then quite obviously that will be indicative of improving soil health. At the, at the end of each of our events, we try and pull everything together and, and we find that this is a really good way to actually demonstrate the effectively is the benefits of actually managing soil well and in particular of actually is like how the, the, your well-managed permanent pasture can actually is like, you know, help actually is like, you know, with carbon sequestration but also managing actually is like, you know, water in general. So preventing floods such as like, you know, which we're seeing more and more around the world, etc. What the trays are, they've got holes in the bottom, so we collect water which is infiltrating, which is like, you know, through the soil and which is like on the roots. And then anything that runs off the front, such as like, so runs out of the, is collected in the front jars. And what you can see is that she's like, you know, is the, well, both, that is that the cleanliness of the water coming through, but also where that water is being deposited. So it's well worth actually, is like, you know, it's just seeing the, um, the, 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 the experiment work. It only takes a few minutes and we'll put on actually, albeit about an inch, an inch and a half of rain in a matter of say five minutes. But it does actually, as like, you know, demonstrate, actually is like, you know, how permanent pasture in particular is actually is a very good way of actually is like, you know, helping to mitigate any sort of climate change. So in essence, actually, is like you know what what I think these this is this is showing, that you know we've got the the permanent pasture at this end, and the permanent pasture, as you can see, have actually has collected all of the water, has actually has percolated through, the the roots and the soil, and effectively has ended up actually is like in the back jar. So there's actually nothing at all in the front, you know. So there's been no runoff, and therefore you know we put in just over an inch and a half in that period of time. And therefore, you know, we could have carried on there and, and it would have carried on percolating and actually all going into the back, which is like, you know, into the back jar. And therefore demonstrating as it's usually, we're not going to get the same runoff. And then the, the ultimately the last one of where we've got, we're replicating a, uh, this is a maize field. So this has been taken out very recently. You can see the roots in there, but Again, I think the one thing that's actually so clear of which is like is how much soil and we're getting more runoff of which is like in the front. And, and most importantly, if you kind of look at the, the level of sediment that we're actually getting in here, of actually that effectively is soil and topsoil, which in real life would of course be actually is like, you know, is running down into rivers and streams, which is like, you know, and so therefore, which is like, you know, it's a very stark difference of actually the same amount of water as you can see from one end actually with permanent pasture as opposed to here with cultivated soil. The next steps will be to actually, it's like, you know, is, to, is to formulate a plan, actually, it's like, you know, so it's, it's, it's to see effectively as actually is like, you know, whether it's actually going out and saying, well, okay, I'm going to go and do some test pits and count the worms, check my soil structure, do a, do a soil analysis, actually, it's like, you know, is to make sure that we've got the basics right in the first instance. So I think it's, it's coming up with a plan for their own individual farm, which is something we'll definitely be helping them with and actually using the, you know, the latest technology is to actually enable them to both work out what they're going to do and then inform us, which will enable us to actually, as I go again, be able to capture what's actually happening, all the good that's happening on our farms already. Because the one thing for certain, having done 11 workshops now, which is like, you know, right throughout the country, there's so much good practice going on, which we can see and that our customers are very interested in and want to know that's going on. 
and more importantly, of actually like what else we can do for the future.